Hello, welcome. I'm Lisa from the library and with me is our speaker today, Leslie Lawson. And we're going to wait for just a minute or so to make sure everyone has a chance to get logged on that is registered. We're expecting a good crowd today. Um, thank you so much for registering. I'm very excited about the topic and the speaker today. And I think a lot of you were too, because we got a lot of registration. A um, Couple of housekeeping things today before we get started. This will be um, a CLE credit presentation today. So those of you who are looking for the certificate of attendance will see that by email later today. I just need to go into Zoom after the webinar and verify uh, who actually was in attendance before I send those out. Um, this is an interactive presentation today. So Leslie will be taking questions. And we ask that if you have questions, you use the Q&A function in Zoom for that. Um, nice thing about Q&A is you can make your questions either with your name or anonymously, whatever you're comfortable with, but please uh, feel free to use that and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can today. Um, also, we do have a brief survey we would like for you to take to give us feedback at the end, be looking out for a link to that. And we'd appreciate any of you who take a minute or two to take our survey. So I think with that, I think we've got a number of people Signed on now, I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker today, Leslie Lawson. So grateful to have Leslie here today for this interesting topic and certainly nothing that I'm aware of the library has ever had a presentation on before, uh, which is forensic genealogy. Um, and Leslie certainly has a lot of credentials in the, on this subject. She um, is a forensic genealogist who specializes in locating missing errors, identifying unknown errors, probate research, due diligence, and kinship determination. She has a number of credentials with several professional associations, including past board member of the Association of Professional Genealogists, past president of the Council for the Advancement of Professional, uh, I'm sorry, of Forensic Genealogists, and immediate past president of the Oregon Chapter of Association of Professional Genealogists. She is coming to us from near Portland today, where I, I understand the pollen is really going crazy. So she's also having some allergy. And uh, we hope we can get through this today without you having an, an allergy attack. So thank you so much for being here and I'm gonna disappear. All right. So here's hoping everyone can see my screen clearly and it looks good, Lisa, I hope. Looks great. Okay, we'll go with that. We'll get this started. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. Uh, my goal in this lecture is to offer as much information as I can about the diverse field of forensic genealogy and how to work with a forensic genealogist uh, to give you an idea how we work and what we can bring to your work product. I also understand that there might be others watching this who are not attorneys. So with that in mind, I will try to remember to define acronyms and, that we use in our field so that I won't be confusing. Um, and as my disclaimer here reads, I am not an attorney and I cannot give legal advice. And as a reminder, this work is in fact copyrighted. We will do Q&A here and there through this lecture if uh, that works for you folks. Um, usually most folks wait till the end because I'm gonna cover a lot of ground. I've got 47 slides in this deck. And so I hope by the time I get to the end, I will have answered many questions that might come to mind as we're going through this. Michael Ramage, an attorney and a board certified genealogist is a leader in our profession and he defines forensic genealogy as including the genealogical research, analysis and reporting in cases with legal implications, often involving living individuals. The term forensic genealogy is getting a lot of airplay these days. Most people think of forensic genealogists as working with law enforcement to solve cold cases and catch criminals through DNA analysis mixed with genealogy. Along the same lines, some forensic genealogists use DNA to solve adoption and birth parent cases, while others have been involved in some surprising sperm donor cases. In our business, we use the term for those people investigative genetic genealogy or IGG. And that's the way we refer to those colleagues who do this kind of work. But there are other very practical applications of genealogical research at the service of the legal community. 
And those are cases that you are more likely to be involved in. These include probate, intestacy, missing heirs, elder care, and real estate, quiet title, and perhaps even mineral rights. These are areas which of course deal with property rights and heirships. Anytime people need to prove kinship for a legal reason, a forensic genealogist can help. Now these are the specialties you see listed on this screen. I don't know of anyone who does all of these things. We each specialize in the things that we feel the most called to. So in my case, I spend most of my time on the first bullet point. There are a number of people who find it helpful to hire a forensic genealogist. I have colleagues who do work locating missing people to pay out money for oil and gas payments and others who do quiet title searches to enable the purchase of mineral rights or to ensure that a property transaction can move forward, forward legally. There are also forensics who help adoptees locate birth parents and act as intermediaries in the process. And some people need a medical family tree because a life event that dictates that need. We'll discuss that specifically toward the end of this lecture. Let's start with a short lesson about genealogy and how we establish those who stand to benefit from an inheritance and why. This is a table of consanguinity and it provides a view of family relationships. This one is included in your handout. I wanted you to have a copy of this chart so that you will have it in your hands as a means of seeing how we link people together. We use direct evidence and indirect evidence to make family connections. If you attended the library's MCLE course in September on conservatorship from start to finish presented by the Legal Aid Society of San Diego, you've already seen a version of this particular table. So let's dig into the tool so that you, I wanna help you understand who's who in the family tree. Once we get away from our own family group of mom, dad, and the kids, things can get confusing, particularly for first, second, and third cousins at different levels of removal. The easy way to think of a cousin removed is whether the person is of your generation, and if not, they are removed by one notch. You've moved that notch up or down a generation depending upon who you're looking at. And let me clarify a term which might be unfamiliar to you, nibblings, and I'm going to highlight that. It's right here. It is one row up from the bottom next to children. This is the gender neutral term for nieces and nephews, which we have been using for a few decades already. This covers your siblings, children, and evens up the terminology with children in one lump. And this view of the family tree, of course, represents a family with no divorces, no remarriages, endogamy, half siblings, stepchildren, or misidentified parents. From being overwhelmed by family, cousins, and all the removed people, we narrow our field of search by who the law defines as being in the lawful line of inheritance. The person in black in about the middle, right here, is our deceased person that we're starting all of the research with. We add the information you're able to provide us, and then we dig into the records. Most states require us to go back only to the grandparent level and then bring the lines forward to today. We begin this work with all the information that can be provided by the attorney, the personal representative, also known as the PR, or the person in charge of the estate. Then we fully investigate the deceased and build their database into a genealogy program. Once we have our target person added to the database, we add parents to the family tree and then children or siblings. Simply, we do start with what you know, and then we research and build the tree out from there. It seems pretty straightforward, but there are many Andersons and Browns and Lees and Smiths and other common names which can make the work more complex. This means that we look at the details of each potential name to compare correlate and analyze the probability that that person could be part of the family being researched. We build timelines and we use maps to test contextually if the kinship hypothesis makes sense. It takes more than one record or document 
to meet our standards of evidence to add a person to a tree. Goal one for my business is don't miss anybody. There are complexities in doing this work and some very serious consequences if the work is not done correctly or if it's incomplete. Let's discuss some of those. The first thing I want you to understand is that people lie. They lie to attorneys, guardians, and even the person that they've asked to be their personal representative for their estate. And they do this because they are sure that they can take their secrets to the grave with them. And yes, sometimes their secrets can seem absurd or trivial when we learn about them, but we try to put ourselves in the context of that person, that day, and their perspectives. Consider a person immigrating from Germany in the 1930s or the 40s. They might have claimed that they were Swiss for a better chance at being accepted into the US. People marry in Las Vegas and divorce in Mexico. These people may feel shame or the need to protect the facts. There are so many reasons people lie. We don't judge them. We do use that perspective to guide our research as we learn about our subjects. So let's talk about our first case. The first thing I want you to understand, whoops, sorry. Clicked on it and then it didn't go. Um, so in this instance, Elizabeth wrote out her will and made this statement under oath. I am not presently married and I have no children living or deceased. I garnered all the information I could from the will and the personal representative and I began the research to rebuild Elizabeth's life. I needed to create for the attorney a list of heirs to notify about Elizabeth's estate. I knew from the personal representative that Elizabeth was of German descent, so I fully expected that I would have to go back to Germany to discover if there were any surviving siblings. A full background investigation was done for Elizabeth and her husband. We flesh out these facts to help put flesh on the bones, if you will. It didn't take long before I came across this document and forwarded it to the attorney. Both the attorney and the personal representative were in shock. There in fact was a child. I had to hire a researcher in Germany to get the child's birth information file. Ultimately, that file included the date of her adoption by Elizabeth's husband. And that gave further proof that we had indeed located the right family group. Because there is a child, all other work tracing Elizabeth's other family members was stopped. The only heir to notify in Elizabeth's estate is this person. I had to discover if that child was still living or not. And for those who might not know, a petition for naturalization must include a detail of all the living members of one's family or household at the time the document is filled out. So the truth is, there is a child and that child was alive and well. As I note on this slide, the PR, her best friend, never knew. To say that she was gobsmacked is an understatement. But people lie. The next case we're gonna discuss is about a fellow who was in hospice. His time was very short and my work needed to be done as quick as I could make it happen. This fellow was physically and mentally in severe decline, but I had to figure out who his family members were before he died so that the guardian could file the probate in a timely manner with all the years notified, I, to notify, identified in advance. This fellow gave us his name and some identifying documents, but we needed to do the background work to discover who his family was, specifically who his heirs at law were. It wouldn't take long for me to discover that this case was a name change case. Name change cases can be tough to crack. We are constantly evaluating the evidence in the documents to compare and correlate and verify and validate the results. And you will hear that a lot through this lecture. Compare, correlate, verify, validate. We do this on every single person to make sure we've got the right person pinned to the right family group. In the interview, the client stated his name was Robert Lewis Stevenson. 
And I hope you recognize that name, the name of the famous author. As an aside, the fellow liked to dress like James Dean. And now I hope you might recognize the era of his raising. Let's talk about the interview with this man. He said his name was Robert Louis Stevenson and that he had several ex-wives and hundreds of kids. His father's name was Arthur. His mother's name was Irene. His brother's name was Donald. And there was a letter from a cousin in the file with a different surname than Robert's. The guardian had a number of items that she was able to share with me. ID cards, two social security numbers, and a passport, all with the name of Robert Stevenson. They were all consistent, reflecting the same date and place of birth. And there was a love letter he had saved all these many years between his parents, Irene and Arthur. So there were grains of truth from the information he gave us in the interview on the previous slide. We start this work by creating a new database for our case. Person one is our deceased client. In my database, I always color this, this name in red. They are the target all the other names need to be related to. And then we add all the other names you are able to provide us. After adding all the names and running all the names through the databases, it became obvious pretty quickly it was a name change case. There were no hits. There was nothing. This family group did not exist in the record sets. When I had exhausted all the potential searches for Robert, Irene, Arthur, and Donald, I pulled the cousin's letter and I did his family line. By the time the cousin had, by this time rather, the cousin had passed, but doing his family tree helped to give me the break that I needed because I had found them all. And the cousin's children were also heirs to notify in this case as well. So it was still time well spent on the case. In this work, we sometimes feel like we back up a lot and then we try to come forward again. In name change cases, it's really true. Compare, correlate, verify, validate every single addition. The cousin's letter told the guardian that he was Robert's cousin and that if they needed any further information about the family to let him know. And then the cousin died. The guardian didn't know that until I did the work on this family group. So let me tell you about Robert Louis Stevenson. He had never been married. He had no children. His parents were Arthur and Irene, but not with the surname of Stevenson. His brother, Donald, died before age one. As a matter of fact, Robert wasn't born until two years after Donald's death. Robert never knew Donald. And Robert's extended family had thought him dead years before because he had called them in the mid 1980s and told them that he would die soon. That was when he changed his name and he never saw or spoke to any of them again. When I called Robert's guardian to let her know his real name, she didn't believe I'd done the work correctly. She requested photos that the family might have to verify my work. I called the point of contact in the family and I asked him for photos. And thankfully he was happy to be helpful. He scanned and emailed a number of them for me and, and I forwarded those to the guardian. My phone rang minutes later with the exclamation of, oh my God, it's him. Indeed, it is. The Guardian had me get the photos printed and mailed to her. Once she received the physical photos, she took those with her to do an in-person interview and visit with Robert. When she walked into his room, she called him by his birth name. As you might expect, he was surprised and his eyes grew fairly wide upon realizing the guardian now knew his secret. She went on to tell him that she knew who he was and that he had been in touch or that she rather had been in touch with the cousins. Additionally, the cousins had sent photos for him and she began sharing those photos I had sent to her one by one. One of the photos was of, 
was of a favorite aunt and uncle. And I was told that when she showed him that photo, he quickly snatched it from her hands and hugged it to his chest as the tears rolled down his cheeks. And the addition of work that I did on this estate, the family also received a medical family tree because there were medical issues within that family and they wanted the tree to go with uh, the genealogy. Here's another instance of a lie. What we don't know is whether this was identity theft or not. I'm inclined to believe that it was. This fellow's birth name was in fact, Paul Frank Allison. By 1940, his mother had been married a number of times. And as was common in that era, children were given the surname of the most current stepfather. By 1940, both he and his mother were using the Hannafin surname. In the examples on this slide, we have two different social security numbers and two different death dates. The databases tie these two people together with totally different names, but records reflect the same date and place of birth. They also reflect the same parents. On one record, the father is Benjamin and on the other record, it's Frank. As was very common in the previous centuries, many people were called by their middle names instead of their given names. The father's full name was in fact, Benjamin Franklin Allison, otherwise known as Frank to everyone who knew him. The record on the right reflects the birth name, but you'll note that Social Security made a note that right here, evidence other than birth records submitted, US citizen or alien allowed to work. This information along with the odd death date makes me believe that this might've been an identity theft. I have the death certificate for the fellow on the left. The one on the right, I'm back to believing that it was identity theft. So let's talk about another case. This is more a case of half-truths. The will states, I hereby declare that I am a single person, my wife having divorced me many years ago, that I'm the father of three children, all deceased, that I have two grandchildren and three great-granddaughters. So let's unpack that statement. He stated that he was the father of three children. Well, factually, he was the father of four children. The next statement that he had two grandchildren was accurate. He went on to state that he had three great granddaughters. Factually, he had two great granddaughters and one step great granddaughter. That fourth, fourth child who was still living when he passed was acknowledged in a codicil. Her father left her $10. The father was 43 when his youngest child was born, and the mother of that child was a mere 16. Again, people and families are unpredictable. They lie, they act out, and sometimes they change the facts, even if it is a legal document. This next case is a little nod to San Diego history. It's not my case, but a piece of history to highlight that probate has always had its challenges. Sometimes people write their wills later in life and then they try to go by memory. Mary Chase Walker Morse stated that there were four nieces. In fact, there were five. I'm more inclined to believe this case was an issue of getting older and not clearly remembering how many nieces she had when she was putting her affairs in order. And keep in mind that we also see gaps in family knowledge due to the ability to more easily move for any reason. Many families sprinkled themselves across the country for work or other opportunities or for sunshine and warm weather. Many went far, far from home. Up until the 80s and even the 90s, keeping up with family members meant taking time to write letters or make expensive long distance phone calls or not. Once the connection is broken, it's rarely reconnected until a genealogist comes along. And as noted in this slide, this will is referred to as a holographic will. Simply, that means that the will is handwritten by the individual and signed by them, excuse me, signed by them as well. If you were the guardian 
to a living person whose time is growing short, I'd encourage you to have this work done now. My clients find it makes the entire probate process flow so much smoother when the, their individual passes and when it comes time for them to file that probate. As we've already discussed, people lie. Verifying that family information is always a good idea. Have the documents ready that you'll need to share with a forensic genealogist or to help you fill out the death certificate accurately. In the case of Robert Stevenson, the guardian was able to accurately fill out his parents' name on the death certificate. And this was possible because the work was done before he passed. There was no birth record in his possession. I believe he did his best to make all documents in his possession that had his birth name disappear. It was his intent to take his secret to the grave with him. So let's take a minute and discuss what a forensic genealogist does. We gather a lot of clues from all of the documents that you're able to provide us. We create a research plan so that we can achieve success for your research request. We have research logs and client databases that we keep all our notes and we correlate all our data. We conduct research online as well as through live resources so that we can analyze and correlate the data and deliver the findings as is the requirement of the standards of my profession. And we prepare affidavits, do diligence reports and charts for use in the court or elsewhere as defined by the client. These are some of the products we use. These are our tools, but we rely on experience, curiosity, and lateral thinking to put ourselves in the path of our research subjects. I also wanted to make sure to cover the databases we use to do this work. There is no one place online that has everything we need to do this work. We do a lot of compare, correlate, verify, and validate between each of these databases. And keep in mind that not everything is digital. All of my cases involve calling research facilities and people affiliated with the case. As for genealogy software, I used Roots Magic, but there are a host of other different options. You pick the one that works for you. For databases, these are the big four. Then we need to go deeper and sometimes we need to seek out state and county resources as well. We all use newspapers, I have a number of newspaper subscriptions. And we, see, we search out cemeteries as well. If we were trying to locate a particular person in a particular cemetery, we're gonna be calling the cemeteries in hopes of finding the person we're looking for. There are people finding databases that help us locate living people. And we use both paid and free. And we use Google because everybody uses Google. It, it is a helpful thing. And like you, we use email, phone, and even fax. And continuing education is a requirement for us all. I've given additional information in your handout should you wish to learn more about becoming a forensic genealogist yourself. So let's talk about skill sets in doing this work. There will be those who try to do this work who are not trained in this field. For those trying to break into the forensic field, you need to make sure you are skilled and trained in the basics. You need to know how to analyze the documents you're looking at, as well as how to create an affidavit should one be needed for your case. As noted previously, we start with our target person that all the other people must be related to. We use all the documents that we can get from our clients so that they can capture, or we can capture, all of the names, the dates, and the places. In other words, we use evidence to link people together in order to prove kinship. We follow the obvious path of the person who died or is in hospice. You know, we were looking for those parents. We want to uh, make sure that we get all of that information listed. If we've got a death certificate, we want all the information in the database. If we've got a birth record, we want that information there as well. And then we go to the record sets to see if you can locate this family group. Then step back a generation to begin the verification process. As we've been discussing here, 
we, I want you to refer you back to the consanguinity chart in your handout. So let's look at the next case. In this case, Lucina didn't leave much in the world. And as noted from this slide, her estate was valued at less than $2,500. So there's not a lot there. And the administrator who did this work stated there were no known heirs or next of kin. Likely the administrator might've asked the neighbors if they knew of any family or they might have asked the landlord of the place that she was living. As noted on this slide, the answer was none known. The person who didn't do the work correctly missed the facts. What we don't know is if there was a full search done of Lucina's home. If there was, did they search for all the legal documents? Did they search for an address book? People of this generation would have kept an address book. Lucina was one of six children at the time of her death and she had 12 living nieces and nephews. They were never informed of her death and the money to Lucina's estate is sheeted to the state of Nevada. The wrong person did the research. If you are a guardian, please make sure to search for address books. Additionally, please save photo albums you come across. I am asked by family members in nearly every case what became of the photo albums they knew that existed. Trust me when I tell you the photo albums will be gladly rehomed by many family members. When I do this work, I always learn who the family genealogist is. These are the people the rest of the family identify as the person I need to talk with. They are the ones who are desperate not to lose their family history. So let's talk about another case. In this next case, we're going to discuss a fellow by the name of John. The attorney who hired me didn't know the researcher who had done the work, so they sent the case to me for review before they filed it with the court. The unnamed state, not California, hired an individual who, according to her website, was a degreed archivist. This researcher took the low hanging fruit without really knowing what they were looking for. She was not a trained forensic genealogist. Ultimately, I had to let the attorney know that the work done on John's behalf was not correct and that we needed to begin again. But it was better to know now rather than after they filed the case with the court. Some of you might be curious, what triggers a review for an attorney or a guardian? If the work was produced by a person who is not a known forensic genealogist, or if the work was produced by an air search firm, you might start to second guess the results. Let your intuition guide you and ask for help. We'll discuss air search firms and their business model here in a few minutes. John had left living children that the researcher had missed entirely. Because the family is so fractured, they were not easily discoverable but they were alive and well. I feel I need to remind people that storybook families, they only exist on TV. Families do have issues and many drift or break apart. In the end, there were six people to notify in John's case. It really does matter who you hire. Where to find forensic genealogists? The first place I generally send people is the Association of Professional Genealogists, or as we call it, APG. At this point in time, there are more than 2,300 members of APG worldwide. There are many others doing this work who are not members of APG. But to clarify, those of us who are APG members sign a code of ethics, and we must complete yearly continuing education hours. And if our clients have a problem with our work, they can submit a complaint with APG to have their concerns reviewed. Whether you hire an APG member or not, I would always encourage you to interview the people you're thinking of hiring. As you interview this person, you need to know if they have the skills needed based on what you need as a final work product. I have some clients who absolutely must have an affidavit as an end product. Asking the prospective researcher if they have ever created such a document is a legitimate question. 
asking them how many cases they've worked on or how much experience they have in the forensic field are also fair questions. As to air search firms, I'm first going to refer you to the handout. I will add the caveat that APG doesn't have professionals in every corner of the world. Air search firms don't either. But if there is not an APG forensic genealogy in that geography that you need one, an air search firm might be willing to take on the project for a percentage. I'll discuss the business model for the air search firm in just a moment. Additionally, as noted as the last item on this slide, Ancestry and Legacy Tree are newcomers to the field. Both offer to do this work, but their business model is to sell research packages. So let's first talk about the forensic genealogist business model. A forensic genealogist is a small business owner typically. We work by the hour to find all the missing heirs to an estate or descendants of long past deed holders and so forth. Our client authorizes blocks of time initially, but at some point we get to what I call the point of no return. And this means that I'm gonna give you my best guess for hours. I'll be close, but I won't be exact as we locate the last stragglers of a family group. But in any case, you will be billed for the actual number of hours expended on your case. Nothing more or nothing less. We remain available to our clients for any questions after the report is submitted. So if you come up with a question two weeks, even a month after we've submitted our report, call us. We're more than happy to clarify any questions you might have. We're frequently asked by others uh, within the family group about financial details of an estate. We rarely know the financial details of any estate matter. Why? Because it doesn't have anything to do with locating heirs at law. Okay, so let's take a minute now and discuss air search firms business model. The trigger for air search firms are the cases that are filed in the courts with the words unknown heirs or air search underway. Simply, if you don't have a list of heirs to notify in your case, that air search firm is going to be in hot pursuit of those people you need to notify. They are in a race with you to get to the heirs before you do. I would encourage you to read the articles that are shared in the handout, and they will give you a better understanding of how air search firms work. Air search, air searcher based filings are done with the notation that proof of kinship will be filed at a later date. Since their initial work is done quickly, and you know how easy it is to match the wrong people to the right family, it becomes incumbent on the probate attorney to prove or disprove the air search firm's assertions. This can end up costing the estate more in research if the air search list they put forward is incorrect. After all, what are the risks for the air search firm? If they're wrong, all they've given up is a few hours of time scouting court records and a database or two. Be aware that in some countries, the air search firm is the primary business model for finding missing heirs, and they work hand in glove with the legal and notarial professionals. In those countries, I believe this is a reflection of the fact that they have to wait until the, the estate is settled to get paid, which can take a while. And so they gamble their time against an unknown payout and the risk of potentially receiving nothing or just enough to cover costs. All of my repeat clients have me review any cases that an air search firm has created. Those clients need assurances that no one was skipped. So as previously noted, the work is essentially done twice. Why? We're back to goal one, don't miss anybody. Regardless of who did the work, we need to make sure that no one is missed or left out. When you think you are ready to hire a forensic genealogist, call and talk to them. It's an interview for both of you. For myself, I'm happy to consult and educate attorneys and paralegals about what we can and what we cannot do. The professional should be able to provide you with a contract and a rate sheet that outlines their hourly fee as well as potential costs should they need to purchase something on your behalf. Again, Ethical genealogists charge by the hour, and we feel strongly about this. 
We are serious researchers and business owners. We do not want to waste your money on any case search. I'd encourage you to scan all the documents you have, or you can mail them. I have some clients who will only mail me documents or fax them to me. I'm happy to work with them in any manner that feels most comfortable for them. And because of that, I think I have one of the last fax machines left on the planet. I work with a number of attorneys and have established relationships of trust so that they know they can call and ask a question at any time and get my answers and my opinions. I don't charge for that. I value the opportunity to weigh in early in the event of a, a gnarly time-consuming case, or even if there's a no there there, call me if you have questions. I'm happy to consult about your case. And I think most of my colleagues share the same business approach. We work as trusted partners with you. These are some of the documents we like to see and the information we like to gather. Our goal is to move from fact finding to discovery. Each document you're able to share with us allows us to put family groups together. From this list, you can see we quickly move into discovery mode. We need to know everything you know about the person being researched. Each draft of a will or a trust can help us know how many kids we expect to find or how many grandchildren. Relationships can be spelled out in some documents and not in others. I like to start my research with the death certificate. And then every record group you're able to provide helps to build this family tree on solid ground. If you're in touch with family members, I might need to interview them as well. And I can tell you right now, many will say to you, oh, I don't know anything. In fact, they know so much more about their family than they even realize. Please know that every family has a branch that doesn't talk with others, my own included. And some families are very fractured and broken and totally unaware of who they are related to at all. The professional's contract should outline for you what the end product possibilities are. In this field, we work to the end product. I know that if I receive a case out of New York or Texas, the end product is an affidavit. Some clients need only a due diligence report that outlines for the court all of the steps I've taken to try to prove a line. If I wasn't successful, I need to let the court know what that research process looked like. If in my business, we do the research and we find all of the errors, each person that calls in to verify they received my letter are asked the same series of questions. This interview process helps to make sure that no one is missed. One person might tell me about a half sibling that the other siblings might have excluded. My process has proven very effective in making sure no one is missed. We do find people who do not want contact with their family and they do not want their family members to know where they are. In those instances, I highlight their name and address for the attorney and note that the information is to be kept private. Otherwise, it would be put on the probate filing and findable. My genealogy program creates these reports and many more. Regardless of the type of end product the client selects, they all get a descendancy chart, which is what you're looking at here. Every name in green is an heir to notify. The address list for heirs will be put in the same order as the above list. This keeps the family groups together. If your chart has purple on it, that means that this particular line needs you to reach out to the heir to collect additional proof. Most times you will need to get a copy of that individual's birth record to prove parentage. And please know that I'm happy to change colors that I use. I've, I've got a number I can pick from in my program if you are one of the millions of people who are affected by color blindness. And some attorneys want a wall chart, also called a box chart. One of the firms I work with want the descendancy report in the court records as it uses less paper but they want the wall charts so that they can clearly see the lines and what generation the individual heirs are located on. You can have both types of reports. You only need to let me know that you want them both. The computer program creates them and it's as easy as pressing a button. And again, if you need me to use different colors, 
You need only ask. People have different reasons they might want or need a medical family tree. The ones I've been asked to create were for legitimate reasons. The first family wanted to know what family line the schizophrenia entered their family on, which lines were affected and which weren't. The family wanted to know the cause of death for each family member from their generation back to uh, the grandparents. The goal was to have four generations in total. Additionally, they wanted to know the cause of death and the contributing causes of death for their ancestors. This gave them a clear understanding of what they have inherited from the previous generations. This also was helpful for adoptees to learn about birth families. They need this information for themselves so that they can share it with their physicians. If you have a DNA problem, I have a specialist I'm going to refer you to. If you have an oil and gas need, I have a specialist I'm gonna refer you to there as well. Both of these fields are really pretty specialized. So you need someone who is trained in those fields to bring you the most value. I'm not that person. Military repatriation, what is it? It is the finding of living family members to test to get a soldier who died in the field home to his family. The military is still working to identify soldiers from World War II and Korea. I don't know if they've yet started working on family members for Vietnam vets, but I expect they have. Surprisingly, not everyone who is contacted in these cases wants to help. One of the cases I worked on years ago caused me to go back to the third cousin on the paternal line. Those people didn't know the soldier, but they jumped at that chance to bring one of their own home. If you go back to that consanguinity chart, you'll note that the common ancestor with a third cousin are your great great grandparents. Social security, that was an interesting case to work on. Some people need to prove facts in their lives and the woman who hired me needed to prove that she had never been divorced. Thankfully, she never left her home state and her husband moved to the East Coast and stayed put in one community as well. He married and stated he had never been divorced. A full search for both marriage and divorce indexes was undertaken for both parties. I submitted a due diligence report to the client who filed that report with Social Security. Social Security did their own investigation and discovered the same information I had. The woman had never been divorced and she received a nice large check based on her husband's Social Security record. The second wife had married before she was legally allowed to so she had her own explaining to do to the authorities. It seems she had married about three weeks and six days before her required waiting period had ended on her own divorce. And then there was the problem of explaining to Social Security why she had married a married man. We do work on some strange cases sometimes. All requests approved or denied, all requests that are made to me are approved or denied based upon whether I feel the request is in fact legitimate. So let's talk about another case. I do get a number of these type of cases every year. In the examples we're gonna see, we're talking about a piece of land that was not properly described in a deed in the 1922 version. I had to figure out the family lines of three people for this particular case. They were tied to each other by marriage. They were the last people owning the land before it was improperly described in the 1922 deed. And I don't yet know what kind of process will be taken to correct that deed. The backstory is that a woman who owned the land deeded it to her husband in her will. He remarried and deeded it to his next wife on his death. And the last woman standing sold it and it was incorrectly recorded in the 1922 deed record. So here are the surveyors uh, descriptions of the land. They each wrote this land description differently, but I can assure you I've poured over both of them and the land was properly recorded on both of these documents. The short description on this particular piece right here was missing some key pieces from the land description that were on the previous documents. Now this case, as I said, has yet to be resolved so we don't know what the court's going to do to fix it. 
because we have the additional problem of standing here in 2021, almost 100 years have now gone by. And now we add to the problem because now 100 years later, the river has changed the land as well. So the attorneys, the surveyor's office, and the court are gonna have their work cut out for them in an effort to get this particular deed fixed. This is the last case, but added in for fun as long as we're talking about land and deeds. The link to read more about the church in New York is in your handout. I've worked on two reverter cause cases. Both were school districts. Uh, one had sold the old school and when the research was done in the county deed records, they discovered much too late that there was a reverter cause on the land and I had to locate all the descendants of a couple who had died at the start of the last century. In the second case, they listened and uh, took my suggestion and pulled the original deed. All work was stopped when they discovered that the reverter clause was on that deed. The message in italics on this slide is pretty standard verbiage for reverter clauses. You can exchange church for school and still get the message very clearly that the property would revert to themselves that being the original owners or their heirs if it were to be used for anything other than the purpose of a meeting house or a school. They got to choose the language when they donated the land. And just like churches, many schools were started by that property owner deeding to the school that little section of land. The key to avoiding void running into this problem is to always pull the original land deed before you think you wanna go through with a sale always pull that original. It might be worth mentioning that I'm discussing cases and events outside of California. And the reason is that it is rare that a case stays in one location or one state. As we trace people out and up the family tree, our research typically takes us into other states and sometimes internationally. Prior wills and probates may be found elsewhere, which may also figure in to your case. And the truth of the matter is that sometimes, but not often, our research leads to a dead end. And you need to know up front that can happen. Most of the time, the people we cannot find are people who do not want to be found. They live on the edge of society and may have addictions, mental and or physical issues, or running away from someone or something. They fall between the cracks. And unfortunately, it has to be said, some are displaced against their will. Sometimes their family don't know if they're alive or dead. All they know is that the person hasn't been seen in 20, 30, 50 years. And there's just no way for us to even get a tiny hint as to where they might be. In this case, a private investigator might be of help or not. In any case, when I produce a due diligence report, I will recap the steps I've taken because I will have tried with all of my ability to find this person as due diligence requires of me. And then I can state to the court that there is a negative finding for this person. A piece of advice here is that a missing person is a missing person, no matter when they went missing. A family can file a police report with a last known address at any time. At minimum, this action will put your relative in a database. On the other hand, it might actually lead to finding your missing person. That's exactly what happened in one of my cases. A relative had been missing for a couple of years and I recommended that the family file that missing persons report at the local police station with the old invalid address. It turned out that the police knew the whereabouts of the man as they had frequent contact with him. He had gone from missing to back in contact with his daughter. He had his own reasons for cutting off contact with his family. It's what he needed to do for his personal well being at that time. And if, a, if an estate is small and the probate attorney or the PR needs to give a budget up front so that we know what, whether or not we think we can get the work done. And if the estate is especially small, it might be turned over to the state and closed immediately. That was likely what happened in Lucina's case that we discussed earlier. And I've had the joy of being that I told that my work was the cause of a family reunion. That a family that had wanted to find each other was now completely reunited. I was called a few weeks before the reunion date and the family called to ask for a final family tree that they could have printed in their location 
so that they could put it on the wall for all to see. I was more than happy to send them that tree. We don't always know what causes a break in a family group. In the instance of this story that I just shared with you, there was a young couple and they'd moved for one spouse's job. They kept in touch with an older family member and then there was a house fire and they lost everything. And I mean, everything. Christmas came that year, but no card came from the elderly family member. That family member had passed away and they moved for the spouse's job and they knew then that all contact was likely lost. That is until I came along to find all the heirs to an estate. The woman I needed to talk with called when she got my letter and her first questions were of who I had already located within her family because she desperately wanted her own family back. So it's one of those rewarding stories that we can always share when you reunite a family. I hope I was able to give you some insight as to what we do and how we do this work and the ways we might be able to help you. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have, Lisa. We do have a couple of questions. Let me read those for you. Um, I'll just, uh, one thing I wanted to note is I have gotten a couple of questions about whether this recording will be posted um, after the, the fact today, and it is going to be posted on our YouTube channel. So um, I just wanted to answer that question for anyone who might have it. Um, so first question from an anonymous attendee, are you able to identify whether someone acquired US citizenship or only obtained a green card? Is that something that you would That depends to? on the time period. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it really is totally dependent on the time period. Some of the databases that are online now have uh, copies of uh, naturalization citizenship paperwork, or it will point you in the right direction for naturalization paperwork, but it really is dependent on the time period and the state, of course. Not all states and time periods are created equally. So here's another question from an anonymous attendee. It's a little long, but I'll try to read it quickly here. A client asked for help proving that her mother was a purchaser of a cashier's check for several thousand dollars made payable to the decedent's name that was forwarded by the bank to the state claims department after death. Since the receipt or copy of check could not be found among the mother's belongings, the state refused to turn the amount over to the decedent's heirs, saying that the check could have been purchased by anyone with the mother's name across the country. Is this a, something that a research firm like yours could help resolve? I don't know. It doesn't sound like something I would typically try to chase down. Um, I've, I've never heard such a circumstance, so that wouldn't that wouldn't be interesting just to chase it. But I I don't know. <laughs> And uh, a follow-up on the first question about the green card is that the, regarding the green card, the decedent moved to the U.S. around the 1950s and left in the 1980s. So I don't know if that helps to answer that question. No, that, that's a tough era simply because we, we wouldn't have ships passengers lists by then. We, we won't have that availability to compare the records. So it, it would be tough to, to track that one down. So I think that's our last question and it's good timing because it's just about one o'clock. So not seeing any other questions being posted here. Um, oh, okay. Um, one more, well, we'll take one more here. Just to confirm you were able to conduct an air search anywhere in the world. Um, I had the same question also. <laughs> so well, I can get it started. And then what I typically do once, once it leaves the United States will depend upon which one of uh, my researchers I send it to. Um, I've, got, I've, I've got someone right now working in Chile. I've got somebody else right now working in Ireland, uh, another person in Australia. You know, it just, it just depends on where the work takes us as to, you know, where, where I'm gonna send it off to. And, and then what I do is I'm, I'm then become a, a manager of, the, of that, that process. And that person will report back to me what their findings are and send any documents I might request of them and um, locate the errors that I need to locate in whatever country that, that research took us to. 
So one more question, and then we're going to have to wrap up. When you request copies of naturalization records, are these document requests limited by the Privacy Act, if you know? Um, generally, those you can get, uh, you can get those as a FOIA request through the National Archives. All right, well, that'll wrap things up. Um, thank you so much, Leslie. And you can see here, um, everyone, her contact information on the last slide, if you're interested in following up with her at all. We really appreciate your time today. Very interesting topic. And uh, that'll do it. Thank you very much.